Hello everybody and uh, welcome to our channel, The Audio Couple. And as promised um, a few videos ago, I said that we'll do a, a deep dive into my loudspeakers, uh, the JBL M2s. Um, yes, quite a significant floor stander, but of course, uh, because um, you know I own the loudspeakers, I can't really give a let's call it unbiased uh, review. So I, this time around, I won't call it a review. It's more my impressions, and maybe also from other or potential uh, other owners, uh, just some insights into uh, my journey with the loudspeaker so so long. And I've had the loudspeakers now for just over six months, uh, and it was quite a, a journey. So I'd like to share uh, with you the audio community out there you know my specific uh, journey and experience with the loudspeakers especially uh, you know what is quite important I think more is the um, the actual performance of the loudspeaker in my listening environment uh, yes again maybe it's not the ideal environment but at least um, I could set it up and you know within I think about three months I got it as such that um, I felt that the loudspeaker uh, system is performing well in my listening room uh, to such a degree that uh, degree or such a degree that I experience let's call it you know satisfaction let's call it that <laughs> but anyway guys yes so um, let's take our attention to the actual uh, loudspeaker yes um, quite yeah like I said a substantial floor standard a base reflex design um, with uh, active crossover of course external active uh, crossover um, uh, base reflex design a two-way uh, loudspeaker design um, and of course um, there's actually three components so we can also call it maybe five components to the loudspeaker the, but the main three components of the loudspeakers of course the tweeter the compression uh, driver tweeter uh, a base a base driver a 15 inch base driver and then of course the other uh, third component uh, is the waveguide you know very specific waveguide uh, a lot of time and attention went into the design of the waveguide but I must also state that uh, of course they went in a lot of um, uh, design into the the hoofer uh, and then of course the let's call it mid tweeter uh, compression driver unit at the top yes uh, JBL spent a lot of time developing these loudspeakers and of course we know JBL from uh, the professional audio arena uh, also from theater etc so JBL a uh, company with a lot of experience so um, of course they put in a lot of their expertise into the design of these loudspeakers predominantly it was more designed for studio type of uh, setup uh, where people will do uh, critical monitoring uh, of audio you know um, uh, and also you could also do use the loudspeaker for mastering and of course if you start using the loudspeaker for mastering uh, the big um, a part of that should be a uh, you know very accurate loudspeaker, accurate internality in dispers uh, dispersion, uh, but also of course um, in how it reproduces the, the audio without compression. Um, very dynamic, these type of thing, low distortion. And this is exactly, um, you know, the design criteria for JBL when they designed the M2s, the JBL M2s, uh, is to ensure the lowest possible distortion, widest dynamic range, and uh, low compression. Of course, the dynamic range and compression goes hand in hand. So, looking from a dynamic perspective, yes, the loudspeakers are indeed uh, very dynamic. Um, but of course, uh, in a studio environment, um, typically you'll use the loudspeakers at a monitoring level of about 85 dB SPL. You know, even in my listening room, if we just use it, um, you know, um, late at night to listen to some music, it, uh, it is quite a full sound and very detailed. And this is what I actually like about the loudspeaker. But we'll come to the actual audio performance later in the review. I just want to now focus and take our attention back to the, the loudspeaker. Of course, I mentioned these three main components. Of course, another component is the actual um, enclosure of the loudspeaker, where uh, JBL also spent a lot of time on that. Uh, it's typically one inch M MDF uh, material to give it uh, ruggedness uh, and to ensure damping inside the cabinet, etc. Uh, and then, of course, uh, it's in, we've got two ports that we can't see in this frame but I'll share a picture with you as well so it's it's, it's dual ported this base uh, reflex design then maybe another part that we can't see there is some protection for the tweeter a DC protection circuit in there uh, it's a high pass type of uh, configuration uh, and it won't allow uh, low frequencies to, to, to get to the mid-range tweeter compression driver so now maybe if we talk more about the D2 driver, it's actually uh, designated as the D2430 uh, tweeter. Uh, and what makes it actually quite uh, spectacular or 
extraordinary is that it's actually a dual diagram, dual coil uh, compression driver. The, um, this specific design ensures that the tweeter has got very low distortion and of course a wide dynamic range and low compression. I think JBL is quite proud on this driver because they went a lot of time and effort into getting the, uh, this uh, driver just uh, perfect and yes um, one of the uh, top of the line uh, tweeters. Uh, they also use this in the professional arena uh, you know into the um, array loudspeakers the professional array loudspeakers and very successful so you know so quite a, a good driver for them the d2 yeah guys so if we take our attention to uh, the hoofer it's a 15 inch hoofer a proprietary design of course by jbl and the model number is actually the 2216nd uh, hoover and the ND is because they're using neodymium magnets and quite an interesting design and um, if you look at the picture of the hoover um, the overall construction you'll notice uh, it looks very modern or space age um, look uh, uh, there's a number of reasons why they took uh, you know made the design as such but main, one of the main factors is that they try to to get rid of uh, temperatures at the back of the of the voice coil and also around the magnet structure so the aluminium construction around the you know the voice coil is basically there to to act as a heat sink to lower temperatures near the voice coil and also near the magnet because neodymium is actually quite sensitive to temperature but of course, um, you know, in this case, it won't really be an issue. But just to make sure, um, the engineers from JBL uh, designed the, uh, the actual uh, die cast frame of the hoover as such that it uh, gets rid of temperatures uh, near the voice call, etc. Then uh, if we talk about uh, maybe uh, some other physical uh, characteristics of the loudspeaker, um, it's about uh, 1.256 meters high. Uh, in height. Uh, it's about uh, just over uh, 500 millimeters wide and about 356 uh, millimeters deep. Uh, and overall uh, the weight has come in around uh, 60 kgs. And yeah, quite a substantial loudspeaker, but once it's placed in a room it actually uh, doesn't take up a lot of, uh, let's call it floor uh, space uh, and the reason behind is because it's actually the profile of the loudspeaker is not that deep and that actually um, opens up a lot of uh, placement possibilities and because it is front uh, ported um, so it can go quite close to the rear walls if need be but of course we try to st uh, stay clear of rear walls uh, because of you know a base performance etc then we can also start talking about the actual um, specifications, further specifications, the more, you know, audio uh, specifications. So this loudspeaker is also capable of going, uh, you know, achieving uh, 20 hertz uh, in the lower bands and all the, uh, all the way up to about 40 kilohertz. So it's quite a wide bandwidth loudspeaker, full bandwidth, let's call it that. And that's what attracted me uh, to the JBL M2s is because, um, you know, your in-room frequency response is quite wide, you know, and important for it to go down to around 20 hertz for me um, because a lot of information is contained you know in the lower registers and of, of course bass always uh, you know forms a good uh, foundation for for a lot of uh, audio material uh, but then uh, just as important is your higher frequency and of course this dual diagram a compression driver can achieve up to 40 kilohertz which is also quite a, a feat uh, then the crossover frequency is around 800, um, you know, between 800 and 850, I would say. Uh, but of course, that is all managed here, uh, the active crossover, a separate active crossover from BSS, um, the London architecture the crossover unit, which we'll also discuss uh, in, in depth just now. Then further to this, um, yeah, the loudspeaker is capable of achieving about 123 dB of sound pressure level easily uh, in any environment. That yes, these loudspeakers are capable of achieving quite loud uh, sound pressure levels. But what is maybe more important is that um, even at that high sound pressure levels, the loudspeaker never sounds stressed or, you know, um, that um, it, sound, it seems loud. So they can achieve these uh, high levels um, you know, of SPL quite easily uh, without uh, sounding stress. And I think that's just a testament of the actual um, 
uh, quality of the design of the actual drivers, etc. And that's also one of the design criteria. Remember low compression uh, from the drivers, and I think that's that's what they've uh, they've achieved here. Then, if we just focus on the actual um, waveguide, you can see a quite an interesting uh, design, uh, different to your normal waveguides. But what is maybe important is that you'll notice that it matches the outline of the um, or the extremities of the actual waveguide matches the the hoofer, which is quite important to ensure ensure uniform dispersion together with the hoofer and also to cup, couple to it, you know, acoustically uh, to the hoofer. Uh, and then furthermore is that the horizontal dispersion is about 120 degrees and the vertical dispersion is about 100 uh, degrees in the vertical direction. So together with this wide dispersion um, and coupling, let's call it that, uh, the overall uh, let's say sound field and dispersion uh, in the room is very uniform uh, across uh, you know a wide bandwidth and this actually contributes also towards the actual overall I call it enjoyment of the loudspeaker but also realistic reproduction in a room and it also um, you know in your listening spot um, can actually achieve quite a wide uh, sweet spot uh, you know and, and this was for me also quite important but um, in general this loudspeaker creates a very realistic uh, um, you know, sound picture, um, you know, and that is also what makes it quite uh, phenomenal in, in that sense. Yeah, so now uh, in this part, let's talk more about the active crossover. You know, it's an external active crossover, and basically you'll need the active crossover together with two power amplifiers. So, of course, the one power amplifier, a stereo power amplifier, or two mono blocks to drive the, um, the hoofer, you know, up to about 800, 850 um, hertz. And then you'll need another amplifier, a stereo amplifier, also two mono blocks uh, to drive the compression driver mid range uh, tweeter. So, uh, everything above 850 let's say hertz um, all the way to, to 40 kilohertz um, and that uh, in a sense makes it quite um, configurable I would say together with the active crossover this is of course the BSS uh, London architecture BLU in my case the BLU 100 active crossover unit and it's um, what they call a uh, 12 by 8 uh, processor DSP let's call it DSP and the reason why they call it um, a 12 by 8 is it's actually got um, 12 inputs with um, 8 outputs so um, in my case I use four of the outputs uh, so of course um, you know left and right uh, to drive the tweet and bass uh, that gives me four outputs but then I've got still another four additional outputs that I can maybe use for some subwoofers or maybe an extra set of loudspeakers or whatever but I think um, you know top of mind is basically, basically additional uh, subwoofers if you want to configure that on the active crossover but in my case uh, I don't um, need the uh, you know further uh, maybe subwoofers um, these speakers are really capable of uh, producing um, you know lower bass and um, the bass is so realistic that I don't think you need to actually um, you know augment it with some additional subwoofers but the option is there if you have maybe a very large room or whatever or that the uh, acoustic properties are such that you need subwoofers in, in your facility or in your room then you've also got that capabilities then um, I think that's more or less it. Um, look, regarding configuration from, from, from JBL as well, as look, um, uh, JBL also supports the crown amplific amplification together with the onboard uh, DSP that supports the IQ net architecture. Uh, and of course, uh, these are then, uh, you know, um, DSP coupled with some specific architect to enable. Um, also third-party software and third-party applications but what is important um, in those crown amplifiers and also in the BSS architecture is that you'll be able to upload the JBL configuration file you know into the actual unit to ensure that there's a match you know that the all the characteristics that JBL have uh, let's call it pre-configured for the loudspeaker is uh, then being able to load it into the the processing unit and that that then forms part of the actual crossover that will um, so you can't change that that is um, not user configurable data uh, this speaker config file then contains the actual crossover and then maybe some parameters which they've uh, JBL have uh, fine-tuned for for the actual optimal performance of the loudspeaker some of the other um, options that you can configure in the BSS is of course some fine uh, tuning of various frequencies so if you have some um, 
uh, let's call it a suck out of certain frequencies or so, so sudden increases in frequencies, this you'll be able then to, to fine tune with the BSS um, software. Together with, of course, some room um, calibration software, either on a laptop or um, other third party calibration tools. And I must say, um, uh, HFX came out to my, my room the day that we installed the loudspeakers and they used the um, room calibration software together with the BSS and we were able to calibrate the sound um, as an initial phase uh, very well. And um, the, the, the you know, out of box, let's call it performance, were actually uh, quite good. The other uh, configuration options is actually that you use the Crown iTech and MacroTech amplifiers with their built-in DSP capabilities. And both these uh, amplifiers can actually, if it's um, you know, a four-channel amplifier, for instance, um, you know, they will, are, actually able to, to, you are actually able to use the internal DSP together with the JBL configuration file to then uh, also... Um, tweak the loudspeaker for optimal performance. So there's various configurations, like I said, the one that I'm using with the BSS architecture, the BLE100, and using some my, you know, external uh, uh, power amplification. Um, and for, uh, on my actual configuration, I use uh, a Mark Levinson 432 stereo power amplifier to drive the bass, and then the Manly um, Reference 600 uh, valve power amps to drive uh, the mid-top uh, compression driver in, in this configuration. And um, I must say, um, excellent performance. I, there's nothing uh, that I could ask more for. Uh, but I think in the next section, let's just talk a bit more about um, the performance, but also some concerns that I had regarding the performance. Okay, guys, so now let's just talk about the actual performance or let's say concerns that I had around the performance. Look, first of all, I'm actually quite um, old fashioned, let's call it that. I, I like loudspeakers with a, um, let's call it a, a passive crossover. Um, the reason for that being is that, you know, um, if the loudspeaker is well designed with a, a passive crossover, you can always, um, you know, improve your um, power amplification, you know, to, 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 to improve the loudspeaker performance. You know, of course, with here we talk about premium loudspeakers or, or top of the range type loudspeakers where you expect the passive crossover to be well, you know, integrated into the loudspeaker. Uh, and there I've noticed that, you know, if you have good power amplification that is able to produce a wide variety, a wide um, dynamic range, but also wide frequency response. I think that's very important. And to actively control uh, the loudspeaker together with its passive uh, crossover, you can achieve very good results. And uh, here I, I talk about loudspeakers like the Dantec Souverains. Also, again, let's call it a, um, let's say, master, mastering type of loudspeaker. You can use it uh, in studio um, setups where it's a very accurate loudspeaker, you know, tonality, etc. And also low compression, these type of things. With the Dantex, I've achieved very good results. And that's why my mindset was basically on a, uh, a passive uh, type of loudspeaker. This is my preference. In the active domain, yes, I think it's, um, you know, if we talk a bit more about the active uh, and the, the BSS capabilities, yes, it, it gave me a lot more flexibility and I could really fine tune the, the loudspeaker. So it's basically this active versus passive uh, crossover situation or uh, configuration for, for loudspeakers. And uh, again, like I've mentioned, the, the Dantec, the Souverains, my, uh, my previous loudspeakers, which I still have, I'm just using them in a different room. Um, you know, the, the results from them is actually quite astonishing. Um, um, you know, the accuracy, etc. And um, so the uh, passive crossover was well integrated into the speaker, the overall design, etc. And that's why it could achieve such good fidelity. But I'm also glad that we I had the Dantec Souverains because um, basically what it um, enables you to do is to to know when, um, you know, a loudspeaker is actually in balance, that there's not a bass overhang or that the, the tops are, you know, too extended or what, or that the mid-range is too forward or, or these type of things. And then very accurate tonality coupled with uh, accurate phase response. Yeah. Um, so, yes, I'm glad I had the loudspeaker, so I was able then to, let's say, uh, discern um, when my configuration was as, as close as possible to being neutral or natural, let's call it that. So I'm really, let's call it a passive, uh, old school type of person with, um, you know, passive crossovers. But now I realized with active crossovers, and uh, I mean this type of um, professional, um, external type of um, uh, active crossovers that the, the BSS uh, architecture 
um, allowed you to, to actually do is that you can, you know, the, the, it adds to the flexibility of the loudspeaker and you can actually get closer to, let's call it, real world uh, performance um, levels. Yes, and then another um, other consideration is, look, uh, I think it's well known that I actually prefer uh, valve preamplification, and I was concerned that if I have something in between the preamp and the power amplifiers, like the uh, BLE100, that it will sort of uh, add its own characteristics to the sound, or that I'll lose some of the, the valve, um, let's call it, musicality. From, from the setup. But uh, I could um, actually with confidence report back that the actual BLU unit uh, you know, adds this um, capability of doing the crossover but together with that some DSP so to, you know, to, to improve the, the, the room response of the loudspeaker. Um, but it doesn't add or subtract anything from let's say the, um, the musicality that I, I get through my valve preamplifier. Pre so look, um, I, I also the one of the first things that I did regarding the BLU100, I had a look inside and I realized, oh, they're using op amps in the, uh, in the crossover. And I thought, oh, uh, this performance robbing op amps, you know, a type of stigma um, that people uh, connect to op amps. And um, so they use the, um, the 4580 op amp, which is quite a good amp or op amp. Um, and uh, yeah, all that I can say is that I'm just glad that this um, configuration inside the BLU 100 unit um, and across, I think they use it across uh, the series, all the BLU units, um, you know, is quite neutral in a sense and it doesn't, um, you know, in, in my sense, let's say add or subtract anything to the sound, especially coming then uh, from the preamp. And I'm quite happy to report that and that was one of my biggest concerns. Um, yes, do you get better op amps in, in my mind? Perhaps you do. Uh, but I think this is a quite uh, low noise, uh, wide bandwidth um, op amp with excellent uh, common mode rejection and of course it's uh, the, 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 the crossover is full, fully balanced and I actually use it in the fully balanced configuration which um, you know I just there was no, no issues for me there. Uh, in my younger days as a student definitely I tried uh, various op amps especially uh, the four double five twos um, I think it's a well-known one but a few others as well I mean uh, these that the medical um, medical industry will use like the OP27, the OP37 uh, and then a few others, you know, es esoteric type of uh, op amps. Um, a lot of them sound very accurate and fast but they don't sound musical, you've got the same issue um, where I've always returned to the four double five twos which sound a bit more more musical uh, but uh, in this case I must say the 4580 as well regarding op amps um, I th felt that the, the performance is good enough or let's say uh, to such a degree that you know it doesn't subtract anything from from the audio which for on my side I was really um, happy with uh, but was a big concern uh, at the start. Right so I think this that then uh, addresses more the concerns that I had with the um, BLU100 it was more around you know the 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 analog part uh, on the on the digital sides I've got no issues uh, you know it's very uh, configurable um, you know and easy to access um, it's straightforward in that sense and you can quickly on the fly actually make changes um, and you can actually judge this the sound as such uh, but on the analog sides that was always my concern in most of you know my gear the analog part for me is very important um, and it it had uh, unfortunately op amps, the 4580s as mentioned, but uh, I can uh, happily report back that um, guys don't be concerned. I think that this, this op amp is very low noise, wide bandwidth as, as reported um, and it doesn't uh, subtract anything from the sound that I could perceive. Um, so in that case I think it's um, it's a well-rounded product, a good product, the, the BSS uh, BLU100 and a few others. You know the BLU50 is the, the smaller version with a fewer fewer inputs but luckily also four outputs if I'm not mistaken. Um, uh, the one um, you know benefit with the BLU50 is that it doesn't have any um, fans incorporated into the, the chassis, the main chassis. There the actual power supplies are externally. Uh, but with my uh, unit, the BLU100, 
um, you actually have uh, fans incorporated. And what I did is I immediately ordered a, a low noise fan and I've incorporated this low low noise fan uh, into the main chassis. Because the, the actual, it's more of a professional type of rack installation uh, type of uh, design. And here, of course, um, you know, if you have high density inside the actual cabinet, you need some, some cooling uh, because it can maybe be cl situated close to am other amplifiers or devices that generate heat. And of course, uh, this DSP needs also to, um, you know, get rid of, um, you know, the, the, the heat that's generated inside the unit. But I must say, in my situation, I think it's, it's not uh, a concern. So basically, I replaced the, the two fan configuration with only one of these, let's call it silent type uh, fans in, in the unit. Then uh, let's talk about the, I think the most important part for everybody is then um, look after Nimrod after you've done your room calibration, after you've uh, tweaked it, you know, the speaker is as such that the toe in is perfect and the distance from the rear walls and that the actual loudspeakers couple well to the room and that in the listening spot you have an optimal, let's say, stereo image. What is the performance like? Why did you decide on this loudspeaker, you know? So, yes, I think this is important and maybe to also give a bit of the um, viewers a bit of uh, context. Look, previously I had the Dantec Sovereign loudspeaker, also a... Um, a very large floor stander, a seven driver configuration loudspeaker, very accurate type of uh, loudspeaker, very uh, neutral, let's call it that. Um, but um, if you, um, how can I say, live with this loudspeaker and you get the right ancillaries and actually the right configuration, you can achieve exceptional performance. And that was my go-to loudspeaker for about 14, 15 yeah, I think over 15 years. And it's still um, an excellent loudspeaker, and I do have them in a, in a different application. Uh, um, but I've decided to go for the M2s be, because um, they became available, and I was actually quite interested in in the compression driver type horn configuration uh, because a while back I actually auditioned some, uh, also JBL loudspeakers, the Array 800s. And I was so impressed by the mid-range and the, uh, the projection of the mid-range into a room uh, and the low distortion of what ca is capable from, from the, the array loudspeakers that I had to, you know, get you know, loudspeakers with compression driver technology in a horn type of configuration. And at that stage, I thought that the array 1400s, which weren't available anymore, you know, can't, can't buy them new. Maybe in the uh, pre-owned market, you can actually purchase them now. The opportunity never came up for me to buy the array 1400s, but then uh, opportunity came uh, about that I could get the, the M2s. And I immediately, um, you know, signaled that, yes, I'm quite interested. The only setback, like I said, is because it was a, a active crossover, but I soon realized now that it was actually a benefit to have the, the, the active crossover. Did it live up to the expectations? For sure, the, the M2s. How can I describe the sound? Look, I think it's very open, distributed in the room. I think that the main thing that I now appreciate about the loudspeakers is that it actually, uh, even at low listening levels, you get this full sound. Um, and a lot of detail in, in the sound. So you don't need to actually play these loudspeakers that loud. Even late in the evenings, you can still get a full, it sounds like you have a full orchestra in your uh, listening uh, room. Even at low levels, you know, you can discern a lot of detail, but it's still full and realistic, let's call it that, um, the sound reproduction from these loudspeakers. And, and then if you play them loud, like I've mentioned earlier, they basically go loud without any compression or that they sound stressed and I think this is one of the, the the more important things as well so at any listening level you get this absolute detail and call it headroom in the music um, and very realistic you know sound reproduction yeah and then further to that as well you you know a lot of people when you have this type of configuration where you have a compression driver together with a hoofer the big thing is always that your the efficiency on the compression driver is extremely high so you have to have a hoofer that can match the performance of the compression driver and congratulations to JBL but I mean they've done it for many years is definitely the the hoofer keeps up with the tweeter you know I've never come to a situation where I felt that you know the the, the tweeter's 
is more dynamic than, uh, than what we achieve in the bass. You know, the distribution of sound and the coupling and let's say the matching between the, the, the bass driver and the compression driver is exact. And I think that's partly due to the active crossover, but it's also because of the actual design of these, these, these drivers. You know, they the absolute um, high efficiency and high performance. And um, I can't say that the tweeter outperforms the hoofer or that the hoofer outperforms the tweeter. They actually very much matched and that even in the dispersion of the sound in the room, um, you get that same uh, type of uh, performance. So basically, if we then um, make a long story short, sorry guys, I know this was a bit of a technical um, discussion, um, but that was my whole intent, is to do a bit of a deep dive into the loudspeaker, because um, uh, this time around, you know, it's not just the loudspeaker that you see, but it's got some external parts, for instance, the, the crossover, and that is an integral part of uh, that you have to ensure that you get that part right to, to actually exploit the full potential of this loudspeaker, uh, because a lot of attention was given to you know the actual physical construction of the loudspeaker you know the enclosure the actual base reflex the ports um, the actual driver units that's used you know top of the range you know uh, type of uh, drivers both the compression the actual horn uh, and the hoof and how it is actually integrated into a complete package and then you know the the care and attention as well with the um, the crossover and then the let's call it my the speaker configuration file all of this are just comes together in a package um, that for me is very uh, difficult to beat um, is it um, perfect uh, no i haven't heard a perfect loudspeaker before um, you know in a few instances i came close uh, but i think one of these instances is also the the, the m2s they um, they are capable of you know and I like to use this term, but to bring you closer to the music, and for sure, they, they do this, uh, without dissecting the music too much. You know, you can still um, hear that it's actually an orchestra, or it's basically a blues band, or it's a band that's playing, or just a guitarist, or it's just vocals. Um, and um, what is so astonishing about it is that um, even, uh, you know, if the, you know, it goes through... Uh, these very dynamic passages in the music, the the vocals still clear, stays crystal clear, and you can still hear what the the vocalist is doing, um, you know, while singing in these uh, let's call it demanding passages. Um, if it's now the the vocalist that should be center stage or maybe um, an instrument, you can clearly hear, you know, what the the recording engineer or actually the band was trying to achieve with the the music that you're listening to. So. Um, in that sense, it's it's really it comes to very close to a perfect loudspeaker configuration or let's let's call it overall package. It's just so <laughs> let's call it lifelike. I think it's maybe the realist real uh, the, the right word is that it's mo the most lifelike speaker that I've, I've uh, came across. Um, look, um, there is a few others that I've also listened to. For instance, the Dantec uh, Souverain and another speaker that also came close to to let's call it that perfect situation was the Steinway Lindorf also with the room correction software, remember? So yes, um, I would say these are the loudspeakers that stood out. Yes, maybe in, 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 in future I will be exposed to more loudspeakers. Uh, I don't think, um, I'm, I was trying to be, you know, objective. Uh, that, look, I do own these loudspeakers and of course uh, that will uh, cause me to be a, be a bit more biased. But in general, I think that people that was um, auditioned these loudspeakers also uh, comment that um, you know the performance from these loudspeakers are really um, extraordinary and um, it's the same with me they are really extraordinary and um, if you are after a let's call it compression uh, driver type horn configuration uh, and you want to achieve very good results in a very nice package I can recommend this um, it's really a good loudspeaker and um, like I mentioned as well is you get a lot of other lawn loudspeakers that takes up a lot of um, real estate or, or floor space uh, this is actually for the type of sound uh, that you get they actually don't take up so much for floor space and for the performance levels that you get um, these are definitely a speaker that one can, can, can uh, consider, you know, in your uh, uh, home environment or if you want to, to use it in a, a studio type of, of, of setup.
But guys, I think in general, that's what I wanted to discuss with you uh, as well. It's just, um, you know, a good, give a good overall of the speaker, uh, talk a bit more about the drivers. I think we can talk, uh, you know, for days about the actual um, design elements that went into the, the loudspeaker or design considerations and also about the finer details and other things that I've experienced. But um, you're welcome to engage with me on the channel, you know, send me some questions if you like and we can take that up. Again, like any other loudspeaker, I think room placement is also important and the one loudspeaker is slightly in the corner, but I've um, uh, recently deployed some uh, panels in my room to, to, to help with the uh, absorption of the acoustic energy in, in that corner. The other thing that I also want to mention is I got a lot of uh, people commenting to say, but my but Nimrod, we realized that you situated the loudspeaker, uh, you know, close to the, the the wall, the side wall, and also towards the back wall. That actually forms a bit of a corner. Uh, and how can I actually, you know, um, deploy it as such? But I also want to show people that look, um, we never really in the ideal acoustic environment. You know, even if we treat it, you know, there is there is always some let's say, element that, that isn't maybe covered or that is not ideal. And especially in the home environment, look, where we can't really treat everything because you also, it's your living space, etc. And people need to live in that area as well. And, you know, I've, I've got the same issue with the one loudspeaker that's very, you know, it's close to the, the wall. And it's basically because um, where I sit, I can't move the couch. Uh, further towards the the, the right hand side, then it will abstract uh, people from from entering uh, you know certain areas of the living room. So I have some issue, and that's why I have to to situate it the, the, or situate the loudspeaker closer to to one of the boundary walls. And um, I had to to live with that. But uh, even from the measurements that we took. Um, there wasn't a big impact from uh, where I situated the last speaker and I was actually glad to see that that once we've actually measured the in-room frequency response that the, um, the proximity of the last speaker to the corner didn't impact my uh, sound signature that much. So again there, uh, I think the only thing that I could do basically is for the, um, you know, the first fresnel zone or the first reflection points uh, on the wall, I implemented a um, a panel to absorb a lot of the, the, the acoustic energy there and that basically uh, brought um, a lot of improvement in the dispersion of, of the audio from, from that channel or from that um, uh, part of the, the listening area. Okay, so basically guys, uh, this is Astin um, from the Audio Couple for this week. Uh, yes, um, I think quite a good discussion from my side, uh, quite technical, but um, this is a technical loudspeaker. I mean, it's got a lot of fast facets to it, and, um, uh, but what is most important is how can that equate into high-performance audio, and for sure it does, and um, together myself and Teresa, we enjoy this loudspeaker. I think that also it's important maybe to get um, you know, a perspective from, from Teresa, so maybe, uh, yeah, from your side, uh, Teresa, then uh, maybe the concerns? Yeah, the day when you um, deployed the, the JBLs, it, the, I was a bit concerned because it's not quite like a large floor standard. Yeah, that I used size. to the physical size like the dump takes. Mm. And also the sound stage that it creates, the, the realistic yeah. sound stage yeah. of the dump takes. It sounds was quite, big because yeah. it yeah, it, it projects. Big. It, yeah, could, yeah. it projects quite a big yeah. sound field. Yeah. No, and that's also another thing. And I'm glad that Teresa brought it up because it was also a concern from my mm. side. Look, is to move from a very large physical loudspeaker. I mean, these uh, the Dantex is close to two meters tall, and there's seven driver configurations. So you can think, um, and the speaker is actually configured as such that it has quite a big. Um, yeah, it, um, so basically the Dantex recreates um, quite a big sound field and sound stage, let's call it that. But um, I must say, <laughs> with the JBLs, it's exactly the same thing. But remember, um, we spoke about that. That was one of the design considerations of JBL with the M2s, is to have this even uh, and large uh, dispersion of, of sound, of the sound field. And uh, they definitely got it right. And um, actually when I heard the Array loudspeakers, the Array 800s, I realized that um, with this type of compression driver, you, um, and together with the, the horn of course, you get this um, large uh, sound stage. And not just on the horizontal, um, you know, um, 
uh, field, but also on the vertical, which is very important. Mm. So it's got this huge vertical uh, dispersion. And of course, that's definitely part of the waveguide. And as I explained on this one, you get 120 horizontal degrees of dispersion, but also 100 degrees in, um, in the horizontal uh, plane, which is also significant. And um, that contributes to quite a yeah, large uh, sound field. Are they bigger than the Dantex? It's difficult to say. Um, but are they, they, what, what is good about them is they can create a room filling sound at very low level. But uh, if, you, if you really want to <laughs> uh, get, let's say, concert level uh, type of um, sound pressure levels, these loudspeakers can definitely do that. They always sound composed and even at very low, you know, concert level type of, of sound pressure levels. But guys, yes, um, I think that's it. Uh, as mentioned before, please engage with us. It's very important on these loudspeakers or um, on this uh, review. For potential buyers, um, it could be important to consider all these things before you make a purchase. Um, these loudspeakers are still available. You can buy them new, uh, but I think they are made per order. You could be um, fortunate enough to get some stock uh, somewhere. But So although they were designed, let's say, uh, pre-2012, um, um, and we're basically in production after that from 2012 onwards. It's still uh, up-to-date design, you know, uh, exceptional uh, audio quality that you can get from these loudspeakers. And I've said that many times, so <laughs> anyway. But guys, uh, this, is my, uh, this is us, myself, uh, Nimrod and Teresa, I'm signing off. If you like this channel uh, and if you like this content, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see more of our content, please subscribe. And if you want to get updates, uh, please ring the bell. But that's us guys, Nimrod and Teresa, signing off. Cheers. <laughs>